housing. The Honourable Member for Cowichan, Malahat Langford. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'd like to notify you that I'm going to be splitting my time with the Honourable Member for Abitibi, Timiskaming. Madam Speaker, uh, it's a great honour to stand in this House, as always, on behalf of the wonderful people of Couch and Malahat Langford and, and talk about an issue which is very near and dear to my heart, but which is also consistently one of the top issues that is raised by people where I live. And, you know, I got into politics uh, because of the work I used to do as a former caseworker to former Member of Parliament Jean Crowder. I worked in her office seven years, and I really got to see how the policies and the legislation enacted in this place affected people on the ground. And there were far too many occasions when I was sitting across the table with a tearful constituent who was at the end of their rope because they were having to make a decision about whether they could pay the rent or put good quality food on the table. And in a country as wealthy as ours, that is a shameful thing that that is still going on today. These are problems I was dealing with in the last decade. They're still going on. It's 2018. And so, Madam Speaker, the reason for this motion today is because we have this sense of urgency. This was an urgent issue 10 years ago. It was an urgent issue in 2015 when the Liberals won the election. But there has been a delay, and we have not seen the action live up to that urgency. Um, we all have those stories as members of Parliament. We all have to sit in our constituency offices and try to explain why we're not doing enough to meet it. So, Madam Speaker, let's look at the motion before us because it's got two uh, very important constituent parts. The number one part uh, is going to call upon this House to recognize the right to housing as a human right. And I right, right away want to acknowledge the hard work of my friend and colleague, uh, the member for North Island, Powell River, and her attempt uh, earlier in this parliament to, to actually put that into law through Bill C-325, which was unfortunately voted down by the Liberals. That, that bill would have basically enshrined the right to housing in the Canadian Bill of Rights. And I know the Liberals at the time criticized it. They said, you know, it, using a legal avenue, a rights-based approach is not going to be effective. I think members were saying that uh, you need to have a plan. Well, Madam Speaker, the point they were missing is that when people actually have a legal avenue, that's how you hold your government to account. When you have a, a legal avenue, you can go to the courts, you can make sure that the, not only the legislature, but the executive branch is actually living up to that legal obligation. I know it's not the only answer, but it certainly is a very important and constituent part of the issue that we're trying to deal with today. And Madam Speaker, the second part, and this is probably the critical uh, part of the motion, is that we want this government to bring its funding commitments forward and spend it before the 2019 election. You know, the, <laughs> the Liberals are masters, absolute masters of the long promise, right? They will announce something, and it's usually made up of previously announced funding, it's grossly inflated to include both territorial and provincial funding announcements. And then when you look at the fine print, you see that it's spread out over a whole bunch of years, and the funding is actually not going to come into effect in a big way until after the next election. And so, yes, the national housing strategy was rolled out with great fanfare, but when you look at the budgetary numbers, it's all back-ended to fiscal year 2019, 2020, and beyond. So we have to get into the next parliament. Yes, there is federal money being spent now, but it's nowhere near enough to acknowledge the crisis that exists on the ground. And that's what we're calling on this government to do, to move the spending up, to treat this like the crisis it is, to actually get those units to be built. Now, I want to talk about some of the amazing local initiatives that are going on because uh, it's in the absence of this critically needed federal funding or the fact that we have to wait for it. Uh, I look at associations like Macola Housing Cooperative, uh, the Couch and Housing Association, who are really trying to lead with local efforts to actually uh, get the ball rolling. And in fact, uh, where I live in the Cowichan region, the Cowichan Valley Regional District, we're going into municipal elections this fall, and we're going to have an important referendum question on whether we are going to allocate uh, some funding to the Cowichan Housing Association 
so that they can start taking firm action. So I, I'm really heartened by the incredible work being done by constituents in my riding. They, they have seized the issue. They have done homeless counts. They, uh, there, there's also that, that part of housing, the housing crisis that's frequently not talked about is housing insecurity. People who are one paycheck away from being evicted or have threats from their landlords or who are couch surfing. Uh, it, it is a big issue. And so I wanted to salute that. You know, I don't want to prejudge what the referendum question is going to be, but I hope that the voters in the Couch and Valley uh, look at this referendum question and treat it with the seriousness that it deserves and, and really try to recognize the local efforts that are being made uh, on this particular issue. Um, the other thing, Madam Speaker, you know, I mean, the, the Liberals I know in questions and comments are going to come up with, with all kinds of facts and figures and try to say, well, look, we really are doing something. But the, 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 the really bad thing, the really bad thing, and I, I hear the chirping on the other side, but the really bad thing is that this government is prepared to spend four and a half billion dollars of taxpayers' money on an old pipeline to de deliver diluted bitumen to our coast something that flies in the face of our climate change commitments. And furthermore, they want to expand the export of diluted bitumen. Uh, you know, it just makes an absolute mockery of our climate change commitments. So they can find that kind of money pretty quickly and easily. Uh, and I'm left uh, trying to explain to my six-year-old kids whose future that we're trying to, uh, to, to work on in this place, I have to explain what our current government is doing and, and you know, try to put that in the context of the housing crisis that we are having. Now, Madam Speaker, I think it's always very helpful in this place to, you know, when we are talking about per, uh, particular issues, is to bring the personal stories, because that's ultimately why we're here. And so, Madam Speaker, I just want to talk a little bit about a couple of constituents who, who wrote to me and gave me permission to use their names and, and talk about some of the things that they're going through. I'd like to talk about uh, Wilfred Stevens. Uh, he's a signal father who can barely make ends meet because he's trying to prove that he's the primary caregiver to his children. Uh, he has been struggling to get the child tax benefit. Um, and all of this uh, financial difficulty is basically not allowing him to have that kind of security of making his rental payments. There's an, an, a, a woman named June Thomas in my writing who has been waiting for quite a long time to get her GIS application process. She's currently couch surfing, couch surfing at her age uh, in different family members' homes to try and make ends meet. Uh, and, you know, it's just absolutely unacceptable that our seniors, the people who in previous uh, generations and previous decades built this country to what it is today, that they are still having to live in such abject poverty and trying to find a place to live, one of the most basic human needs that we have. So, Madam Speaker, um, and, and another one, you know, I've got uh, Peter, Peter Emery Smith, uh, you know, he's having problems with the CRA and so on. Like, th these are all issues that relate to people's ability to find housing. And when you don't have that kind of security, it actually affects your entire life, your, your outlook on life, the way you're able to function in society, your ability to hold down a job. That kind of stress wears down on people and it, it, it can lead to further costs down the road, both in their mental health, their physical health. Uh, and so there actually is a real intangible economic cost to not solving the housing crisis. Uh, people will, maybe my conservative friends will argue that it's too costly a venture. I would argue that it's too costly not to do things and, and take this issue with the way it goes. So Madam Speaker, um, you know, I think given that, you know, my time is running out, I will just end on saying that I recognize how uh, critical this issue is. I'm going to be hosting two town halls on housing uh, during the October constituency week. And it's really to try and juxtapose what the traditional federal role used to be in housing, what it is now. Uh, but what more we could be doing uh, from the senior level of government. So, Madam Speaker, I, I hope all honourable members will look at the spirit and intent behind this motion, recognise its urgency, and support us on addressing this very critical issue. Thank you. <clears throat>
The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development. I'd like to thank the member opposite uh, his commitment and his comprehension of the seriousness of the issue and the, the value of investing in housing and the transformational impact on people's lives is, is exactly why we've invested into the national housing strategy. I, I also would like to follow up on the two uh, cases he referenced because those are also within the ministry I work and would be more than happy to help those individuals that contain the benefits they're entitled to. Uh, in terms of what he can say to a six-year-old, um, you know, we are actually spending three, we, in the first two years of office, we spent three times more on housing than we spent on the acquisition of, of, of the Trans Mountain. In fact, we've spent close to uh, $12.6 billion uh, in, in new spendage. That's not part of the $40 billion of, of the national housing strategy, but that's the down payment we made to get into the national housing strategy. And I'd also like to say that over the next 10 years, we'll be spending close to 10 times more than we spent on TMX. So you can rest assured that our investment in housing is by magnitudes of tens of billions of dollars, much, much, much more than anything we spent on that one particular project. But my question for the member opposite is this. In the Nanaimo area, the following projects have been invested in and built and, and created in the, in the last two years. 312 Hearst Avenue. Uh, there's another one at 940 Hectate Avenue. There's another one at the, at the non-profit uh, on-reserve site of Tishat, the, the Tishat First Nations. Additionally, there's another one at the North Cowichan First Nations with the, with the Penelux tribe. Additionally, there's another one in the Tofino. There's an additional investment uh, in, in the reserve at Tishat. And, and there's, it goes on. There's another one at Malahat. There's an additional investment of $960,000 at Oyster Bay. An additional investment uh, in Nanaimo uh, Alberni at uh, Marktosis. There's about eight $18 million in investments that have gone into the area that he represents. Which one of those projects is his favourite and how does he explain the joy of seeing it to his children? <laughs> The R member for Cowichan, Malahat Langford. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I think I need to prevent, uh, provide my friend and colleague with a map of Vancouver Island uh, with the electoral areas, because then he would realize that Nanaimo is, in fact, not in my riding. Uh, so that's a, a bit of an oops. Uh, secondly, what I would say to him is that I love the Library of Parliament, because when you submit a question, you get a clear and concise answer. And Madam Speaker, I'm holding in my hand right now a response from the Library of Parliament that says there are zero dollars announced or committed in the riding of Couch and Malahat Lightford. Questions and comments? Questions et commentaires? The Honourable Member for Sarnia Lambton. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for a great speech and for re revealing uh, what, what most of us on this side of the House are aware of, that zero dollars have been spent. Now, uh, the, the propensity of this government to uh, predict spending in the future uh, is, in my mind, wishful thinking, because they don't even know if they're going to be here in 10 years. And I wondered if um, the member finds the same. The Honourable Member for Cowichan, Malahat Langford. <laughs> Uh, Madam Speaker, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear the full question. I think it was about wishful thinking that the Liberals have. Uh, yes, I, I mean, you know, I, I think I referenced that in my speech that they, they are masters of the long promise, and it's it, a lot of what they announce is kind of predicated on re-electing a Liberal government. That, that's that's what they they like to package these things up, uh, bring them to the electorate, and make it seem like they're actually doing work. But when we get down to the fine print. Uh, you can expose it, the inaction, for what it really and truly is. We see that on their environmental commitments, uh, here in housing, and I really hope that uh, the Liberals will understand the intent behind this motion, that we are seeking to move the funding that's been allocated in later years, get it going now, because here and now is where the crisis is, here and now is when the money needs to be spent. Thank you. Uh, question, uh, question the comment. We have time for a brief question. The Honourable Member for uh, Brandon Suris. Oh, sorry, not, I got the wrong one. Uh, for Suris, Moose Mountain. I always get that one wrong. <laughs> thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and I thank my colleague for his question and, and appreciate his comments. And so, sorry. Um, he, he, met, he, talk, he, talk, he touched very briefly on seniors, and I realize we all have issues in our own writings. And, and likewise, in my writing with the, with the demise of the oil industry, we have a lot of seniors that have homes that they cannot get rid of, and that's their retirement. And short of them investing their money in, on, steam, or, sorry, on cruise ships and spending all their investment on that to travel around the world, they are not going to have a home to live in because the price of the market has died. Does he not believe that this 
that this motion would be better spoken if it had something about the economy in it to advance so we create those jobs that this Liberal government is not investing in. The Honourable Member Cowich and Malahat Lang for a brief uh, answer, please. Well, Madam Speaker, I think you know the the intent behind the motion is pretty broad. It's it's trying to get the government to, to specifically act on something right here and now. Uh, you know his comments about seniors, however, are very welcome because many seniors are on fixed incomes. They are you know very much the most vulnerable members of our society. They are less able to have the agility to adjust to economic shocks, which is why we have to pay particular attention to them when we are designing policy in this area. 